let's get started. So I will be rambling through some politics a little bit, and hopefully this will all tie together nicely. So I have a bunch of friends who uh, tell stories about the future in a lot of different mediums. Um, some of them call themselves futurists, some of them call themselves designers, some of them just call themselves storytellers. Um, and a dear friend of mine a while ago had a set of blog posts which I have endlessly ribbed him about. Um, not because they were bad, they were actually really good and they were interesting and they were presenting a hopeful vision for the future. But the core thesis of this was, uh, of this set of blog posts was in a kind of, how many people here have heard of solar punk as a movement? It's, it's an interesting aesthetic. Go Google it while Tumblr is still up this week. Um, anyway, it was this kind of solar punk manifesto on how we will all go to the stars after the collapse in spaceships built out of recycled aluminum cans. And it's a lovely vision. The problem is that the material properties that we need for aerospace aluminum are not compatible with the aluminum that you get out of recycled cans. Like you, you simply, you can't get here from there. There are reasons why aerospace metals are very complicated. Um, and I say this not because I want to be massively depressing and a downer, although sometimes I am. Um, I say this because I think it's actually a better story when you engage with the details of the material reality. Partially it's a more useful story, right? Because if you, if you build all of your hope on going to the stars on tin cans, and then you realize that you're not going to the stars on tin cans, then you're not really left with anything. But if you dig a bit deeper into that structure and into the material reality of whether it's space travel or, or any other system that we're concerned with, then your, your hope becomes more resilient against the impact of that reality. Um, but also, I think you get more interesting and useful stories about it. So... I want to talk a little bit about what an AI looks like and why I think that is not only a bad name for these systems, but an actively harmful name. So when we have, and in a lot of contexts, when we see the, um, the representation of AIs in culture, right, you have basically three things, right? You have the God in the box, right? There's a little box and in this box is God, and you talk to God, and God does what you want or changes the world around you. Um, and that is the summary of 90% of pop culture representations of AI, is some version of God in the box. Um, and then we have the two big charismatic megafauna. Um, charismatic megafauna is like a, a polar bear, for instance, for climate change. You know, they, they look cuddly, they're big, they're easily noticeable. We care more about them than we do about algae that are going to be what we actually would prefer to have alive. We can give, leave or take polar bears, but, you know, if we start losing the oxygen balance of the world, we're in trouble. So the charismatic megafauna of AI that tend to show up in art are two things, either data centers, and all of this kind of the big physical infrastructure of um, computing and um, some type of generative system, whether it is glass breaking or um, deep dream, you know, all of these creepy pictures of dogs that have too many eyes, right? You know, these are the things that represent what does AI do? Oh, AI draws pictures of the world that are recognizable but horrific. Or AI is this giant building in the middle of the desert that is completely impenetrable and has this geographic footprint. Um, both of those are, are obviously real pictures, right? These are, these are not false representations, but they are also, um, they're tin can spaceships, right? They're, they don't get at the practical reality of interacting with these systems in a functional way and the way that they shape our lives. So in reality, most of what we are talking about when we're talking about AI systems are some combination of classifiers and generators. So a generator is a system which is broadly speaking designed to fool humans, right? It's designed to generate some kind of output that another system, generally a human being, is going to find interesting or useful or meaningful, right? So when you are 
looking at um, auto-generated spam text that you can sort of see what it means, but it's clearly gobbledygook and it's clearly machine-generated in mass volume, so it's different every time to fool the spam filters, right? That's a generator and it's doing the thing that, that it's designed to do. Um, when you interact with uh, an algorithmic chatbot, right, this is, they're generally not implemented in the same way, but that's another primitive form of a generator that's designed to fool a human into presenting some kind of interaction interface. Speech synthesizers are often the same thing, right? Again, slightly different mechanism under the hood. Um, for the most part, generators are less interesting and less useful to us outside of like the entertainment industry and UIs. Um, most of what we think about with AI systems are classifiers, right? So a classifier looks at a set of data, maybe it's a, a picture, and says, does this have a dog in it? Yes, no. Okay, great, this has a dog in it. Um, or maybe it asks a more complicated question, is the current course of this vehicle going to hit this dog? Yes, no. Well, maybe we should apply the brakes, right? And that brakes, that's the interesting bit, right? Because you take a classifier and you hook it up to an automation system. Now, the thing, the automation system isn't normally a black box exactly, right? It's generally, you have certain routines and it says, oh, okay, you know, initiate the braking routine. And then maybe it recognizes, okay, you know, we have this set of parameters and maybe there is a generator in there that generates a braking application curve. But the, um, the, the if then, the, the large scale logic, right? This is a thing that's written by humans who've contextualized the problem in a certain kind of way. Um, one thing which is interesting here is the reality of running a classifier at production scale. Um, this is where you do get the giant buildings full of computers sitting out somewhere cold, maybe. Um, the process that Jules talked about of, of trying to understand what kind of input is going to generate an interesting kind of output um, is not actually that far from the process of running a, uh, running a generator or running a classifier in production. So if you have, say, a market fraud system, right, you're trying to look at a bunch of transactions that are going through a, a, a merchant that processes credit cards and figure out which ones of these are fraud so we can reject the transaction so we're not out money when the you know, payment gets declined later or whatever. Um, as an engineer, you have a bunch of data structures, right? You have um, information about the user's browser, about the session, about the, the account that's being used, about the previous behavior of that account. Um, and then you have a background set of all of the same information for every interaction that's occurred with the system, for every order. And you start picking out things, features that you think might be interesting. You know, sometimes you just throw all the data in there, but this often doesn't work out. Um, so you often, you start picking out a human, picks out, oh, okay, I think, uh, let's take these 100 data points. I think these will maybe be useful. And then you run it on a bunch of training data where you know whether or not the transactions actually ended up being fraudulent. And you see, okay, well, this, this gives me a 70% match. Okay, let's tweak it a bit more. This gives me a 90% match. And it's exploring a computational space. Now, um, the, the process there, if you've, if you've dealt with like a large reference database um, and you're trying to, or a, a large demographic database, and you're trying to answer questions about the world, like, um, you know, what is, the, um, what is the population structure in a given area that's been impacted by such and such disease? Um, that process, of kind of query and refinement is a, lot, is a lot like what the process of building up one of these classifier systems looks like. Um, the actual work is quite similar. And then after you have a sample classifier, you know, you run it in tests for a while, you push it into production, you watch a bunch of trend lines, you're kind of maintaining the system over time. Every now and then maybe you tweak or you retrain the whole classifier. Um, and, and you see what this does to the thing that you're trying to manage in the world, right? And, um, and then you experiment with different pieces of automation that you can hook up to the other side. Okay, do, does it, is it sufficient to uh, run, these, uh, run these purchase requests through an additional step 
where we throw in a CAPTCHA or maybe double check with the bank or, you know, do something like that. Okay, what does this do to our sales pipeline? Otherwise, are we like, you know, harming sales too much otherwise? So it's this, it's this optimization process. Um, and, you know, this tool is very useful and this tool scales well because having individual humans look at those requests is really slow and really expensive. And that translates to bottom line for the merchant and that kind of thing. Um, and that fact that what we're, what we're actually mostly looking at when we say AI is we're looking at statistical, at data-driven statistical social automation. We have a thing which is happening in society, maybe which is happening in the control system of a tool or something, but it's mostly a thing that's happening in society, at least for the things that um, cause direct problems, the things that we are, that we are actually caring about. It's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy to have machine learning in my car's automated braking system, you know, as long as it's not looking at a camera trying to figure out whether or not it's okay to hit that small child. Um, you know, if it's, just, if it's just automating the braking curve, great, have fun. You know, this is optimization, that's fine. Um, we make a moral judgment that some of these uses are totally fine. When we start looking at social automation, though, this is where it all gets very messy. Um, so the problem is that we are sold a narrative that this is AI, that this is the god in the box doing this, right? When it's actually a bunch of math fitting a thing and then a human who's made a bunch of decisions about meaning because the god in the box doesn't actually understand meaning. Um, narratives are used to shape our understanding of reality and to bias us towards certain outcomes. Um, if you are talking to your, um, to your clients, to your customers, and in, in very few cases in these, for these systems does that mean individuals, that means other businesses, right? Maybe you talk about AI, we've got AI-driven predictive fraud learning something, something, it's gonna save you so much money, right? You're selling the god in the box. And if you talk to your investors where you want to, um, you know, tell them about what, what's new and what's novel in your technology so they'll give you more money, they, they don't actually, you know, they see too many gods and boxes. So you talk about deep learning, you talk about neural networks, you talk about, um, you know, we have this novel technology. So you've already, you've stepped one layer back where you're now admitting that there is a thing inside the box that isn't God. Um, and no, no, our, our thing inside the box is different. Please, um, you know, let us, uh, give us money because our thing in the box is cool. And then, of course, when you actually talk to people who are doing the work, you talk about things like statistical automation um, and statistical modeling, because that's what we're actually talking about as a discipline. Um, so AI is a narrative that's designed to hide intentions. And we'll talk a little bit more about the intentions that it's used to, used to hide. Um, so first let's talk about why people like social automation because that obviously ties into the intentions. Um, part of this is, a big part of this is that it's infinitely cheap labor, right? There are a few places where there are things that we do with social automation that you legitimately can't do with large numbers of humans. Uh, and those things mostly have to do with latency where you want something to happen very, very quickly, you know, you want something to happen in real time, whether it's, um, you know, oh, I speak a word and then uh, a web page opens and you can't employ a human to do that even if you're willing to just have this, you know, guy standing next to you at all times with a keyboard because you want the web page to open faster than the human can actually hear what somebody's saying and type it in. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of time it's, it's about cost, right? You can't actually, you can train a human to do all of the same, um, you know, recognition of emotional tells and cross-correlation with social media history that is looked at being done for the, the Smart Border Project. Um, but that human then is actually quite expensive because that's a couple of years of training. They're probably going to be, you know, they, or they may be a fair bit better at it than the AI might be, but they're so expensive that it doesn't matter because you can't do that to everyone who flies into the EU. So it's simply too expensive. Um, there's a whole set of 
desires around cheap labor, which are basically about middle-class servant fantasies in an age of austerity, right? People want to have a servant class. A servant class is too expensive. You are working 90 hours a week because you don't have a union, and you know, your, your wages are being cut left, right, and center. But no, no, just send Toshiba and Samsung some more money, and then you get to pretend that it's 1950 and you have a maid. Um, and this is, you know, in a, in, a, in a population that's been structured around social status and desire and all of these things, this is a, you know, it's a great fantasy. And it's a very productive fantasy, especially if what you need those people to do is to give up massive amounts of social autonomy and personal data. Um, so even that is, is really kind of a trap. The specific trap that is happening, of course, is a trap built out of oligarchs, right? You have a class of people who want to structure reality. They want to structure reality in ways that are very profitable for them. And that's why we've seen most of these developments, right? They are either, we are a security state like the US, like honestly much of Europe, right? We, we require large amounts of social guard labor in order to be able to maintain an unjust and unequal standard of living in the world. This labor is getting too expensive and too hard to manage. Therefore, we need to in some way automate it and reduce it to a machine. And we're willing to accept fairly broad costs in terms of human rights, civil liberty, and the accuracy of, in terms of performance of that labor, as long as it means that we can continue having our protection. So that's one thing. Or you're an oligarch, and the thing that you need to do is to extract an increasingly large amount of wealth out of the world. We're now down to 62 people who control 50% of the world's wealth. Um, it, it's apparently changed in the past six months. We were talking about this at dinner last night. Um, so you're, you're, you're looking at one of those two things. Now, all of this is happening in an interesting context time-wise. We are in what I like to call the age of emergence. So if you've, uh, there's a book by a guy named Philip Bobbitt um, called The Shield of Achilles, and he's looking at the structure of warfare and the structure of governance from the 1450s or so onward. And his basic thesis which is at least moderately convincing, is that you can look at a lot of history and structural terms in the interplay between military strategy and constitutional structures, and that many of the things that we, that we see as isolated conflicts are actually very tightly related. So he calls most of the 20th century a single kind of epochal war, um, looking at the thing otherwise known as state communism, uh, parliamentary democracy and fascism, and that there was a broad conflict between these as, as constitutional systems of governance, which in his mind ended around the, uh, the Cold War um, and encompassed all of World War I and World War II and started, in fact, a little bit earlier than that even. And he draws this, you know, draws this out on the basis of, of kind of similar structures that have happened previously. Um, I find this pretty plausible, but of course, epochs overlap. And one of the interesting things that happened in the 70s is we started learning to see large-scale systems in the world. Um, we'd had some clues that they were there before. We could look at isolated cases of them, but we couldn't look at our world in real time and see the output of emergent systems in the same way. And a lot of this, this showed up with um, demographic modeling, all of the whole earth tabulator stuff that the Nazis paid for in World War II. That turned into really meaningful large-scale demographic statistics that allowed us to see population trends and to start, understand, start understanding causality in population trends. Um, and we, we see the same thing in environmental science, where we start being able to actually build much more meaningful weather models that aren't based on simple long-term trends, but can actually look at the interactions between nodes, right? You divide the, the atmosphere up into a grid, and you start running a simulation, and you can see in much more detail the way, pop, or the way um, pressure highs and lows move around. Um, and you start being able to build these models over time. 
they start out very coarse, and then, you know, as, as Moore's law takes its temporarily inexorable course, you see the increasing granularity of simulation over time. Um, once you can start to see these systems, you try to act on them, right? As soon as you, as soon as you have a very large scale system that is going to have a massive impact on the prosperity of a nation, the prosperity of a company, the prosperity of, of some group of people that's able to constitute their agency in, uh, in a unified way, you want to try to change it because now you can see the train coming before it hits you. Before you, know, you get a demographic bubble and maybe you just get pasted by it because well, you can't do anything about it and you don't realize it's coming and you just react. Um, As we see this new age of control, both from oligarchs and from governments, it's happening in the context of this age of emergence. So I want to talk a little bit about what the tech industry actually is. Um, the tech industry is the realization that if you want to make real money, the, that we are, because, of, because we can now see these large scale systems and because we, of the kind of infrastructure that we've built out, which allows um, scalability of social action, right? Because the internet isn't a communication system, it's an action coordination system. That's the interesting part of it. The communication system is nice, but action coordination is where it impacts the world in a functional way. So if you have a system which allows the rapid coordination of action across society, it gives you the possibility of scaling certain kinds of business models very, very quickly. And if you want to get rich very, very quickly, it turns out that you don't actually need very many of those scalable business models to really hit to make a spectacular amount of money. So the entire VC culture is based on a model that says you will give us 20x return in somewhere between three and six years, and we will accept a 95% failure rate in exchange for that potential upside. Um, among other things, this turns out to be a really, really shitty way to build social infrastructure, right? Because Every time you have one of those massive failures, that, that failure is measured in human lives, often literally, and it's measured in social disruption, all of this kind of stuff. But, you know, that's an externality. The company involved is already folded. We don't care. Um, but that scalable revenue and that potentially unlimited upside is so attractive if your goal is to be one of those 62 people, that it's worth re, you know, completely restructuring society around that scalability. So I would argue that what we have now, like we used to have a tech industry, right? We used to have an industry that built technology that largely speaking answered not necessarily individual needs, but at least the needs of states and the needs of companies. Um, most of what we have now, most of what we have now is an industry that kind of serves the second and third order needs of people trying to manage this process of infinite scalability, of infinite upside. Um, they're not, it's not a tech industry, they're like necromancers of emergence, right? They're trying to summon this kind of shuffling zombie of the infinitely scalable profit from, you know, the corpses of civilization. So that's the background for what is happening in, um, in this age of emergence, right? The, we, are, we are facing a set of challenges which are catastrophic in their impact. You know, the, how many people here are under 40? Great. You will probably see the first two billion people starve to death. Maybe three, maybe four, it depends how unlucky we get. Um, the, because that's, you know, that's what I mean with, with the age of emergence, right? 
Um, it is climate change. It is uh, mass social manipulation. It is learning how to deal with our economy. Those are, you know, learning how to deal with pollution, learning how to deal with all of these emergent, closely, closely intertied infrastructures that we can now see, but that we don't actually know how to manage. We're starting to know how to affect them, and that's what's giving us all of these oligarchs, and that's what's giving us all of these states that are very happy to try large-scale culture and cultural, en cultural engineering for the ends of whether it's controlling their own population or you know, controlling other people's populations. But we don't actually know how it works, right? We, just, we know how to move the needle, and so we're going to keep wagging that needle as hard as we can, and, and you know, maybe something will, will come out. Um, but of course, like the CIA found when it invented, well, not invented, when it started doing a lot of, um, a lot of social manipulation in the 50s and 60s and then invented blowback as a like, oh, wow, it turns out that when you start overthrowing you know, popular governments, eventually people get angry at you. Um, we're still learning what the, what the train wreck of the automation age is. So the background where this scalability, this infinite scalability that the tech industry is, is chasing forever and the infinite scalability that the, um, the governments are, ch are chasing also, where they want, you know, the, how many people here have heard of the British Nudge Unit? Um, it's, a, it's a group within, I think it was started through government digital systems, I don't remember exactly, but it looked at things like, well, if you, um, if you write the organ donation form so that you have to opt out instead of opting in, you get way more organ donors, which is a, absolutely a social good. But now let's apply that to every possible interaction that, that citizens have with their government to shape the outcomes that the state wants, regardless of of anything about um, what the population might want because we assume, and, and you know, rightly from the position of working for the government, we have to assume that the government knows best, so therefore the government you know, gets what it wants. Um, and this is where we start seeing what the box is hiding, right? When you have the god in the box, it's hiding a lot of those kinds of intentions, right? Because the god in the box isn't neutral. And, you know, and, and it assumed that it would be eventually knowable, and specifically that it would eventually be knowable by individual humans. You know, it, it wasn't a collective rationality, it was an individual rationality. Classifier gardening, that process of kind of tweaking and tuning a running system in production, isn't knowledge. It's intuition. It's intuition that's partially embodied in a running system and partially embodied in a set of people who maintain it. But it's, you know, it is, it is gardening, right? It's much more like, oh, if I water here and I plant here and I weed here, we probably get a good crop. Oh, wait, we got a fungus blight. Okay, you know. Um, we can, we can choose explicability for individual classifier systems and individual automation systems. There is a computational overhead to building systems that can explain the reasoning that, you know, the path that they took to get to a given answer. Um, and there is a, there's a um, kind of, it, it, it's an overhead both in terms of, of CPU and GPU hours on the compute side and in terms of the amount of time that it takes the engineers to maintain the system. But it's not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a choice. Um, and we can, of course, explain the automation structures. We can explain all of the decisions that are made in that process. We can open all of this documentation. Um, this is a good thing. It should probably be done. But it doesn't actually solve the root problem because the root problem is one or two steps bigger than that. And the root problem is that even the companies that are gardening these classifiers don't necessarily understand what they're doing in the long term. Right? They are also just growing a garden, and having them explain the steps that they take to grow their garden doesn't actually save you from the potato blight. And we are, we are engineering, at least temporarily, a less resilient society with these interventions. You know, we're engineering a society that makes the emergence of fascism much easier because we're giving these, all of these tools of structural automation. Right? And designing for a resilient society is much, much, much harder. That will be the challenge. However, um, 
part of the problem, so if you look at, there are different ways of modeling systems, right? There are different ways of modeling behavior. You can model behavior within a model structure that assumes that all of your actors are collaborative, right? That everyone is working together. Now, one of the useful pictures, one of the useful things that that model can do is it can generate kind of unlimited upsides where you get kind of perfect lockstep collaboration, right? It can find actual, actually optimal outcomes. Now, models that are built to assume collaboration tend to break really badly when you have adversarial actors. Um, adversarial models are a lot more complicated. You have, you have many, many different sets of intentions. Um, and figuring out optimal structures within adversarial systems is much more computationally or, or cognitively complex. And many of those kinds of perfect upsides simply can't happen. Right? There, are, there, are situ there are outcomes that you cannot reach from structures of adversariality. Now, um, in, you know, in addition to the direct costs, so there's, you know, each modeling structure has its, its real failure modes. Reality, of course, doesn't actually adhere to either of these models. It is a, a vast mix which has far more actual possibilities. Um, the problem is that when we are looking at these kinds of system emergence, right, the explicability, as soon as you have adversarial structures operating within the same model of, of, of trying to impact emergence, trying to shift these structures, the, the system becomes so much more complicated. The governance of the system becomes so much more complicated that it's very difficult to get any kind of functional result out of it. So when we start looking at social automation, when we start looking at the impact of social automation in the society that we live in, where it starts to become problematic is that it is complicating the already impossibly complicated problem of governing emergence because it is allowing the introduction of adversarial structures into lower and lower and more and more direct layers of reality, right? Each of those little wags of the needle makes the governance problem more difficult for everyone else, vastly out of proportion to the benefit that the oligarchs and the security states can extract from the model because these tools barely work at all, right? All of the advertising tools, all of these billions of dollars, trillions of dollars a year that are spent on influencing consumer behavior, one of the dirty secrets of the advertising industry is that it barely works. Like it breaks even, and maybe a little bit more, but come on, you spend a trillion dollars a year to barely break even? This is, you know, uh, horrific. It is, it's honestly a crime against humanity. So tolerating oligarchs shaping society and embedding structures of social automation infrastructure is a threat to the survival of human society. If we are going to manage to actually live through climate change, actually not end up back in another nuclear war, actually unwind some of the massive risks that we've taken as a species and survive through the end of the century with something that will let us keep some of the things that we'd like to keep, like, I don't know, much of Western medicine, species diversity, globally organized trade. We can't tolerate this because these systems are making an already impossible problem too much harder. In summary, we can either have, we can have the, we can have the God inside the, that's currently inside the box, but we can't have the box, right? We either take away the box and just stare at this ugly little homunculus demon and say, okay, fine. You know, this thing is useful in some contexts. We will tolerate it. 
but we see what it is. Like, we see that this is actually just a demon that we've done a deal with, and we're going to watch very closely what it does, or we don't have it at all. You can't have the box. You can have the god, but you can't have the box. And if we, if we tolerate this structure where the, um, where the rich are allowed to automate and shape our society for their interests without regard to what happens to us, it will simply kill us all. And I, I don't mean our children, I mean us, I mean our generation. I mean, you will probably end up being one of those billions of people starving to death. Eat the rich. <laughs> Stop the AIs. <laughs>